Thank you very much, Sam and Beth and Jack, for inviting me to speak today um, about ML286. So ML286, this is where she currently lives, in beautiful Isleworth 8, which is in London. This is at low tide. And uh, with the Thames Discovery Program, we cross uh, the, the Little River Thames to the 8, where ML286 is halt. And she's a part of a very beautiful landscape, um, even in the midst of an Anglo-Saxon fish trap. It's all there in Isleworth 8. So this is BJ Wood and Son Boatyard, and she's halt just behind um, where it says um, BJ Wood and Son. And with the Thames Discovery Program, we take lots of walks. You can see she draws a pretty big crowd. And there are public talks um, about her with um, our project officer, Elliot Rag. And there he is um, down by her remains. So in this presentation, I don't just want you to hear my voice. I want you to hear the voices of the people who are uh, intrinsically um, involved with her story. I remember, I remember those first days on patrol when guileless subs had yet to learn how ML's pitch and roll the jet black night, the days of fog, the gale's fierce steering strife. We didn't get much comfort, but my hat, we did see life. And that's from Gordon S. Maxwell, who served on one of these MLs um, in the First World War. Do we see life? So motor launches were known as movies because they moved very quickly, they were built quickly, and they were involved in many different operations, mine sweeping, um, they were, um, uh, uh, a blockade for the German subs. Um, they are part of a very vibrant and dynamic material culture. They're cons constantly moving and evolving. So ML286, she's a part of archaeology of the present and presence. Does ML286 have agency? Well, in the words of Rupert Brooke, who was also a member of the RNVR, and if the spirit be not there, why is fragrance in the hair? And you could even take that, not just metaphorical, but literal. You could look at those beautiful tree branches and think, that's part of her hair. That's a part of who ML286 is. So Henri Bergson, French philosopher, said, our understanding of time is like a cinema view. We mentally deconstruct time into a following of instants or stages. But this suggestion neglects the idea that things are constantly evolving and therefore lasting. And that's a lovely picture of her transom, by the way. It has been said that it was the long and weary watches of the British Navy that won the war. For quite three quarters of a sailor's life in war, time is spent on watching and waiting. The other quarter is fierce excitement. So is movie ML286 a creative combination of watching, waiting, and fierce excitement? She was built very quickly. So in February 1915, Henry R. Sutphin, he was the general manager of the Electric Launch Company, he meets with the British Naval Authorities, and he's contracted to build 50 MLs, but there's a problem of the neutrality of the United States at the time. So the answer lied in Quebec. Is there any city in the world that stands so nobly as Quebec, the citadel crowns a headland 300 feet high that juts boldly out into the St. Lawrence? So they are prefabricated in Bayonne, New Jersey, but they are assembled in Quebec. On the 1st of May, a pattern boat is in the frame at Elko. And then on the 7th of May, you have the sinking of the Lusitania by the German U-boat. Yeah, U-20. So there's a new contract for 550 of these MLs to be made. So 501 days for 550 movies. Um, and they were built mainly of um, pine uh, that came from Oregon and also um, uh, oak as well. So the deck beams were made of oak. The deck planking was the Oregon pine. And they were about 79 foot and they could hold seven men and they, they were, um, had a speed of 19 knots. Um, they had these standardized motors, um, and that was part of the way that they could be produced very quickly, standardization. And this is Henry R. Sutphin, and he was saying that the bronze struts used to hold the shafts as well as the quadrants and riders were made by Tiffany Studios. Because they were produced so quickly, um, the foundries couldn't keep up, so Tiffany Studios had to provide the, the brass. But what's interesting is that Sutphin, who's not an archaeologist, um, he was saying, um, you know, that there was this romantic feeling um, about the shipbuilding, and he was saying that each boat had a personality. So he's 
very um, in tune with what these movies um, are starting to resemble. And even Eric P. Dawson, who is a Canadian, and he was also a member of the RNVR, he says every movie has a personality. Our movies seem to be beating out joy music from her throbbing engines. And these sailors had a dreadnought stomach because of the movement. These poor young sailors are always seasick. Well, this is the end of a perfect night near the end of our ML Frail, and our cabin looks like a cistern burst in the midst of a jumble sail. So again, that, that idea of movement and this um, tintabulation, as Eric P. Dawson says, of, of the um, pots and pans. So all the ML deliveries were made at launching slips at the St. Lawrence. The first 50 were delivered, but then I stops this from happening. So they're sent by rail to an open port in Halifax, Nova Scotia. 84 movies sent and the shipment um, discontinued in February 1916. Um, the movies were towed in storage basins, and a fleet of 130 transports required to take 550 movies, and all arrived safely. And um, so certain um, members were involved in the creation of her, and most of these um, uh, people who, who put her together and built her up in Quebec couldn't speak English, but they all worked together to produce these ships. She also, ML-286, has a, a great history with Operation Dynamo. She was one of the Dunkirk little ships. And it's very hard to find specific information about um, ML-286, but looking through the National Archives, um, there's a list of other um, uh, little ships that helped in Operation Dynamo. Um, but one of the things that was quite interesting was when these men were interviewed about what they did at Operation Dynamo, they said, I do not consider I did any more than my duty, which I think is quite um, humbling. And some sketches of uh, little MLs, which is quite sweet. I met a little motor launch, she was two years old, said she, her hull was thick with barnacles which stuck her to the key. So this is Ethan, as she was known in the 80s, as a houseboat. So after the Second World War, she became a houseboat, she had a different engine put in. But these are some of the recollections. Um, me and my three friends used to work for the couple who owned the little ship. Um, she was moored on the Thames in the old Windsor opposite the Bells of Oosley um, public house. When I said we worked, we were all about 15 years old back in the summer of 1978. The owners were Ron and Greta Gill, and they had a boat hire service, and we would take charge of the rentals throughout our summer holidays from school, all for free as it was such good fun. We spent many a happy summer holiday on the boat, even though she never moved from her moorings. My name is Nigel Jones. My three friends are Martin Carver, Tony McKeith, and Simon Baker. So these men are also part of Ethan's history. She had a weary, tired air as if her health were bad. Her stem had lately come unglued. Her paintwork made me sad. So what's in a name? Well, Ethan. So Alexander William Kinglake wrote a travel um, book about his journeys to the Far East. So this phenomenological approach to the world, when one attempts to reveal the world as it is actually experienced directly by a subject, as opposed to how we might theoretically assume it to be. And King Lake says the same thing. He says, I'm writing a book um, about not those impressions which ought to have been produced upon any well-constituted mind, but by those which were really and truly received at the time of his rambles. So is the TDP frog approach to our Ethan a phenomenological approach? Does ML-286 have agency? Does our movie move the frog? Things like persons possess agency because they bodily affect us and help to structure our consciousness. Does it have a thing power, the curious ability of inanimate things to animate, act, and produce effects, dramatic or subtle? Most of the Thames Discovery Program volunteers are known as the frogs, the members of the Foreshore Recording Observation Group. They talk, talk about being happy and excited. So here's a little video clip of um, just to demonstrate that, oops, and hopefully that will work, oops. Oops, not working. I might have to come back to that. Nope, it's not gonna work. <laughs> oops, pardon me. That's it, now, let's keep our fingers crossed. <laughs> Thank you. You can see the different phases of wiring on the earlier. You've got the old the old lead cable. Yeah. 
And then you got the twin and earth. Two box. <laughs> it's fantastic. <laughs> Two pin plug. So we had to de weed her because we were getting to make a um, 3D model of her. And that's what we were doing this summer with the Thames Discovery Program. And this is the two-pin plug. Um, so her sights and sounds, dreams, happy as her day, and laughter learned to friends and gentleness in hearts at peace under an English heaven, members of the Thames Discovery Frog. Um, a nobleman, notary, a navi, a nut, a banker, a butcher, a baker, a drover, a dentist, a dustman, a duke, a cabman, a candlestick maker, these were the young boys who were serving on these MLs. This war has made sailors as well as soldiers out of the office boy and clerk, Bird a porter, Smith a plumber, Jones a calendar artist, grimy, the name needs, uh, itself needs no explanation. So when they were writing home, a lot of these boys would say, I'm in the pink, so that their families wouldn't worry. Um, and this is, uh, from, this is a painting by Jeffrey Stephen Alfrey. He was a war artist and he served aboard ML-286. He was her commander. Dawn was theirs in sunset and colors of the earth. What are those distant shapes dimly ahead? Brave ships that fought and fell, brave men who died. Shadows of yesterday living though dead, sleeping eternally under the tide. And there's Jeffrey Stephen Alfrey. So there is some documentary evidence of him serving aboard ML-286, as well as the Canadian, Lieutenant Samuel William Salmon. They say that the dead die not, but remain near to the rich heirs of their grief and mirth. So what happened to Alfrey? Well, he was commander of ML-247. He was part of a four-boat flotilla. Gale force winds happened at St. Ives Bay. It developed engine trouble. It hit Ore Rock, and it blew up on impact. All crew members except one were killed, including Jeffrey Stephen Alfrey. When she sleeps, her soul I know goes a wander on the air. Wings where I may never go leave her lying still and fair, waiting empty, laid aside like a dress upon a chair. He died at the age of 29, survived by his wife, daughter, Stephanie, and his unborn child. I leapt upon the rock and clasped the sea maid in my arms, for I was quite enchanted by the sweetness of her charms. So I like to think of Alfrey as clasping the sea maid in his arms. Where is she now? Parts of uh, Ethan live on in swanky uh, Chelsea Harbor on a ship called the Kaliak, little houseboat. So I tracked down her wheel and binnacle. So um, uh, they were sold off, parts of her were sold off by the owner of the boatyard. And uh, this is what her wheel and binnacle look like now today. She lives on through things like the Zeebrugge Conference. And there's Dr. Anthony Firth. Um, and we work with Anthony Firth on ML-286. And we're hoping to do a full-scale dig of um, ML-286 in the summer next year. So ML-286 is a movie for all time. She continues to affect people. She's proof that material culture, um, landscape, and people are part of each other and a part of the whole. Just that wonderful image of the beautiful summer, everybody going to see her, even the little doggy there getting his paws muddy. So she's a veteran of World War I and World War II. She has courage and cheerfulness and a fighting spirit, the romantic personal element in which a war fought largely by kid reservists in small boats is bound to be rich. She has personality, charm, beauty, and dignity. And the smile that is eternal she. So this is dedicated, um, as it's the centenary of the end of the First World War, this is dedicated to uh, Lieutenant Jeffrey Stephen Alfrey, to the Motor Launch Patrol, and to ML-286. That's a wrap. Thank you for listening.